This episode of the Better Every Shift podcast is sponsored by Columbia Southern University. Learn more about how you can earn an affordable, accredited quality degree 100% online at columbiasouthern.edu slash fire. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Better Every Shift podcast. My name is Aaron Zamzo. I'll be your host. I'm a fire lieutenant up in Wisconsin. I am not alone on this journey. I'm just very, very fortunate to be the host. The true brains behind this whole thing is Fire Rescue One's editor-in-chief. I call her the Commander Janelle Fasquet. Commander, how goes it today? It's going great. It's going great. I'm really excited for today's show. This show is really catered to me because I like to say I'm the idiot in the room a lot of times when we're learning new concepts because I learn a little differently probably than most and I like to ask questions so I grasp the concept. Now being more in a leadership position, I want to be able to grasp it so I can then teach someone else. And today we got Battalion Chief Chris Paskett with us. He's also a doctor, but he said, don't don't call him doctor, but he's just (laughs) he's that smart. And first of all, let me welcome you. Chief, how are you doing today? Thanks for being here. Great. I am just, I'm happy to be here and I'm just happy to get into the content and and talk about whatever comes up. So for those that are watching on YouTube and think, is he in his closet with this? Yes, (laughs) he is. He's that dedicated to talking about education and organizational education. And he's like- And good acoustics. He's dedicated to good acoustics. Dedicated yeah. best acoustics. That way the dog still can run out and he can focus. So again, thanks for being here. But this isn't the first time you and I talked. It's one of the great parts about this show is that we really try to reach out to listeners. And you sent us an email at better every shift at firerescue1.com. And I read it and I said, okay, I think this is a really good topic. But of course, I didn't know. So I, I just reached out and said, hey, do you want to talk about this? And mm-hmm. we had probably a 45 minute conversation probably went for two hours and, and here you are. So I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, just, I'll give everybody a little bit of background. You're a battalion chief with Eugene Springfield fire in Oregon. You have a doctorate in organizational learning. You've been focusing on organizational learning structure as it relates to fire departments and how, how firefighters and, and how we, we learn most effectively. Uh, you also have studied change management, diverse learning styles, how we store and access knowledge. And, and maybe why we don't access knowledge at certain points and how we deliver it to crews and try to meet our crews and our members where they're at. Give me a little bit more insight. When, when I say organizational learning, that's kind of where I was like, oh, what did you mean? Sure. Well, again, thank you for having me. And I just really have a, a passion for learning and the title of your podcast really you know, better every shift has been a mantra for for me throughout my career. As far as what can I do today just to make uh, myself a little bit better, and it's just been that simple shift by shift over the course of the last twenty five years. And so, as I kind of got into a position where uh, I had my master's and I was looking at, you know, what is that next step? I found this program, which was in organizational leadership, learning and innovation. And it just spoke to me as something that could help help me understand where we could go as a, not only as an organization, but as a fire service, you know, because we are so similar across the fire service. A lot of, you know, our geopolitical boundaries are different, but the things that that make us alike are are more similar than not. And so my thought was, if we can get towards more efficient and more effective learning as we go, then we could all kind of take that that next step together. It was also spurred by by kind of looking at a problem. And so, you know, that's something that I, at some point today, would love to talk about having fire departments ask their, themselves, what is our challenge? What are our barriers uh, to learning? I know for us, I kind of identified a, a barrier and that was that we built a training system designed around on-duty mm-hmm. training. And as we have gotten busier over the course of time, you know, going from somewhere in the neighborhood of 
of 15,000 calls to last year running 52,000 calls with basically the same personnel. But what that's done is that it has shrunk the on-duty time that we've needed to to learn, refine, and hone, you know, hone those skills. And so it's it's left a gap and a challenge for us. And so that was really the premise that I was going into in this program. How do we overcome this this gap? And so that's that's kind of what I was that was under the premise that I was going into this with. Yeah. So we have higher call volume, less time mm-hmm. to train. We have actually more things to train on. Now you mm-hmm. throw lithium ion batteries in there, EMS, mental health, because we're we're now our call volume, as you said, is is going higher. And we're now because we don't say no, we're really, you know, responding to so many things. It's a very diverse kind of span. So and then also our, our attention span is really short because of all the different things that are around us. And see, I just forgot what I was going to ask you because my attention. Span, <laughs> so I'm kidding. <laughs> but that's kind of what it's like, right? Like all of a sudden yeah. it, we have to get this education somehow. And, and, and that's the problem. And let's look at like, how, how do you grade us now as, as a mm-hmm. fire service? How are we doing on, on, on that? Well, that's a great question, and I think it dovetails into the kind of the umbrella that I work under, which is, or that I think under, which is an effective learning organization. And so this is something that has been popularized, uh, uh, Peter Senjay and, and others, over the, the last 30 years, but a an effective learning organization is one that embeds these processes at the individual group and organizational levels to where you are consistently learning as an organization as a process not as something you okay we've got to set out to to learn something today it's more like we show up and this is how it flows this is what we do this is you know everything is is revolving around highly effective learning organization. And so we are all on this sliding scale of of effective and efficient learning organizations. And so I think you know when when we look at how do we do or how are, how are we graded, really that's dependent on each each department. And so if I was looking at a department, there would be 20 things that I would look at to kind of gauge where are you at and if you ask this question about your learning culture or about your learning infrastructure, what what would the answers be there? And that that really varies depending on the department. And so kind of what I was hoping to do today is just talk about four really not simple, but places to start that any department or any individual could start at to say, hey, I'm going to just grab this piece right here and focus on this for right now. And I, I think those are uh, low hanging fruit that, that could really show some benefit in a very short period of time. Perfect. Let's, let's dig into it. Before we do though, l- let me set the table. Let's l- say someone's listening to this and they think that they got it figured out already. They're like, ah, no, we're fine. We're, we're doing it the same way. We, we put a video up on our platform. People say they read it and they click it. So what's, mm-hmm. what's the impact on, on that if we don't really evaluate where we're at? Well, I think the the impact is there. It, it's it's are, are you measuring that? You know, it is really a, a question that I have had. How are we measuring the impact of our actions? Sometimes it's very difficult in the fire service to measure impact because, well, we can look at turnout times and response times and number of incidents. Are we looking, do we have deliverables and measurables for when we show up on scene? How fast do we pull that inch to recorder to reconnect to the alpha side? When do we put that fire under control? How are we gauging our, our effectiveness of some of these operations? How was our size up? You know, did we hit all the benchmarks that we wanted to? Did we do the 360 and, and notice all of those little pieces that, that, or did we miss the basement or something, you know, the power line or something? So really that would be one question is how are you measuring your effectiveness? Mm-hmm. And it's different for each organization, obviously based on, mm-hmm. you know, but you don't have to do it on a fire. You can do it on you know, MVA. You can do it on 
even EMS calls, right? Like you, it, it's a process that you're talking about. Do you have a process for that? Correct. Yeah, and absolutely. And so that's, that's really when you go back to that bigger picture, that is one, one component of that is, are you effectively reviewing your processes and measuring uh, outcomes? And so is your educational, I would just call it your educational process or delivery method, is it supporting those, those pieces or are they disconnected? You know, and one thing that, that we'll probably talk about in the fire service, you can't get something for nothing. And sometimes we rely on a short class or a short, uh, you know, presentation on a virtual platform to give us expert level competency. And it's not going to happen. We're, that's, we're only going to get kind of an awareness level in that 15 or 20 minutes. If we want expert level, we need to dedicate more time and resources to that, to that educational offering. It's kind of like learning Spanish. We had the Spanish or the, the language tutor on teaching us Spanish. And his whole point was, it's great once you start to learn how to speak it, but if you don't continually practice it and, and, and work on it, it just kind of goes to the wayside mm -hmm. a little bit more, right? Like it's, it's kind the of same kind of concept. Into your daily routine, just making it kind of baked into the process. Absolutely. And that speaks to uh, cult a culture of learning, which is one of those 20 pieces uh, that I would look at. What is your culture? Do you do your folks come to work uh, expecting to learn something new or is it a surprise uh, when they are asked to go to a class or go to a drill or something? That's that's a, a culture that can be malleable based on you know leadership and and other components of your organization. All right. Now you got me. Let's dig in. What are your, like, so you have 20 of these areas that you think that, you know, you, you've really honed in on, Hey, this is a way to, to evaluate your department. Uh, we got time for four, but who knows, let's maybe dig into more, but <laughs> let's, let's see. So where would you start? What are, what's one of your four? Well, I mentioned it when we were talking earlier about this shared vision of learning, and you had kind of a visceral re reaction to that to that term vision, you know, because sometimes that's thrown around in a in a way that doesn't really resonate with people or, you know, is something that is not well understood. You know, for me personally, vision is as simple as sitting around the kitchen table in the firehouse and someone saying, you know what would be cool? What if we did this? What if we made this happen? That's a vision. That is a vision of something better, something that doesn't yet exist, that can you know bring us from point A to point B. And so when you overlay that in the context of education and learning and training, that's where you want your vision, especially as that leadership team, to be consistent across the board so you're not fighting with each other. And so that shared vision of learning really is, is key because we have a lot of different pieces coming at us all, all the time. You mentioned, you know, whether it's EV stuff or, you know, whatever PFAS, there's all this stuff that we want to train on and learn. And so prioritizing the vision. And for us, we try to employ a 24 month rolling calendar. So we know Here's the priority of the things that we've already de determined that we really, really feel strongly about. And if there's something else that pops up, we need to make sure that the priority of that of that training or that learning component trumps the what we already have on the calendar. Otherwise, it's just the loudest voice in the room or the flavor of the day or whatever. And then we get kind of off track and then we start pieces start dropping off the table. We've had some, some of our guests on saying it becomes robotic where there, it seems like some organizations just go, Hey, we have to check this box and check this box and check mm -hmm. this box. And what you're saying is let's have an, a plan to do that, but have it big, like big picture, how one fits to the next. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And so let's take, you know, a bloodborne pathogens class versus, you know, a, you know, a PFAS or cancer reduction piece that we really f feel is important. Both are important, but is there a way that we can emphasize one that we can 
you know, maybe our, our organization is doing really well with bloodborne pathogens. We haven't had any sticks, but we're getting good compliance. Does it need the same amount of airtime as, you know, some cancer reduction strategies to where we're not bagging our turnouts, we're not doing clean cab stuff, like we really need focus here. So is there a way that we can emphasize those pieces that are most important to our department? And I think there there definitely is, but you have to plan for it, you know. One well, going with the vision piece, I'm just curious if the, you know, what would be cool kind of conversation at the kitchen table is the idea that that can come from anyone, like, and how is that received? You know, is there a process in terms of how people can bring that to the table, or are we talking specifically about company officers knowing what the broader vision is? Yeah. And, and I just want to throw this out. Like my organization is, I, I feel is a learning organization and, but we don't have it all figured out. Like we're still somewhere on that sliding scale, you know? And so I don't want to give people an impression like we have it nailed and everything is perfect. You know, we are just like every other fire department, we are trying every day to, to get better. And so just having said that, absolutely those those things should be able to come up from from anywhere in the organization especially from the line because those folks are doing the work they are experiencing that you know those things day day in and day out and so you know that's that's very frustrating when you see something or you feel something and you know, there's not any traction to 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 see change positive change there so my 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 feeling on that is there should be an established idea management system within the organization that allows that idea to flow from top to bottom, from bottom to top, and laterally. So everyone has a voice and those ideas can come up in a way that are actually considered and not just kind of brushed off or lost in this email chain. Yeah, and that really feeds the culture of learning. It's like everyone feels like they have a voice in it. I like that a lot. Yeah, absolutely. You're like, you're saying like a strategic suggestion box. <laughs> yeah. And for us, what we're trying to do, and, and we're still trying to get traction on this, but <clears throat> we have a, an operations training board, which is a, a committee that looks at operational <clears throat> suggestions and processes and, you know, kind of makes, changes as we go or helps institute certain things. And so the idea would, would be for, to have those ideas move through that board to where you have a group of people that are really interested in, in looking at things that are going to make us better, as opposed to that idea just going kind of to a black hole somewhere uh, where it doesn't get any traction. And so that would be the, kind of the the gold standard, in my opinion, is this idea drops in a place where people are are wet, ready and willing to receive it. Yeah, that's the key: ready and willing to receive it, mm -hmm. which is probably another t topic that we could talk about. But before we move on from this one, though, I, I do have a question about piggybacking certain concepts. So, for instance, you'd mentioned like you know cancer and say decon is are you finding that let's say we did a quick fire attack drill then stating after that saying, all right, now set up decon, like adding that component to it or somehow incorporating EMS into an actual, you know, training where you might have a firefighter go down. All right, let's do some EMS on that firefighter. It, you know, are you, are you seeing that those are more effective ways to get more components in a shorter amount of time? Well, they, they certainly could be. I, I have the, the research I did for my dissertation was around peer learning, structured peer learning, which, you know, we can talk about a little bit further, but really what I was looking at is, and getting back to your initial point of these short attention spans and not only short attention spans, but just small windows of time to do anything besides run calls, you know, and check out our equipment. So really what I have looked at is 15 to 20 minute windows during the shift to do some of this training 
and to reinforce some of these concepts. And so whether it's adding a piece at the end of a drill like that, or just starting out in the morning uh, and saying, hey, we're going to take 15 minutes and we're going to go over uh, this radio uh, protocol change so we can be more comfortable with it. And then we're going to do it again next shift. And over the course of several shifts, we're actually going to move the needle on on how we, our comfort level and our knowledge level on this particular piece of equipment. Perfect. I, this is, I have to give a shout out to my, my other, my former Lieutenant who really has been a good mentor to me when I was learning to drive the, the aerial, it'd be eight o'clock in the morning. I have a cup of coffee and he'd look at me and say, go. And I, I still get chills because he used to do that, but that I pulled the, pull the aerial out and I go through quick process of placing the stick up to a particular point where he would point out six, six minute drill. Right. But my competence level went up mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Take that five, six, seven minutes, you know, that, but over the course of time, I'd be like, you sure you don't want to say go today and time me because I got you, <laughs> you know? And, and I think that's kind of the idea, right? Like, Hey, let's, let's add these little, these little pieces throughout the day. And it, and it mm -hmm. goes a lot further. Um, that's so absolutely. And I, I just wanted to kind of double down on, I, I think that if you went into any firehouse and, and <clears throat> did a quick survey, I think many firefighters would feel the same way. Like, yeah, just these, these short, these quick hitters, you know, these, these short little drills really have the potential to be very impactful, you know, and it, you know, when we, when we come out and say, let's do this two hour drill, invariably we get blown out of a call or whatever else happens. And so, yeah, it's, I, I think informally it is well understood that, that that's something that's, that's really impactful. I, does that kind of what you're talking about with peer learning? It is. And so peer learning has been, and this is number, this is like a second thing, right? This is yeah. one of your four, isn't it? One, it peer is. Learning is one of your four. Okay. Yeah. And culturally there's been a couple of studies now that have looked at it and culturally it is well accepted that peer learning in the fire service is something that is culturally prevalent and that people enjoy and that we actually learn a great deal from the problem is not everyone gets the benefit and so you can be in a, a firehouse that is a busy firehouse where you have multiple companies and you've got, you know, a company officer or, or a very vocal firefighter or something that that really, you know, is vocal about sharing their knowledge or sharing their experience or sharing stories. And so all of a sudden, everyone at that table gets the benefit of that experience and they they start to learn through the experience of others, you know, what is, what is culturally acceptable or when I might want to do this or not, but not everyone gets that. You could be at a firehouse where, you know, your company officer hasn't shared anything for the last five years. And so really what, what I'm interested in is trying to structure the peer learning process to where for 15 minutes, everyone gets that benefit. So, if we're talking about, you know, SCBA, a new SCBA platform, we're going to do that across the board. And so everyone is going to get their hands on this, this new SCBA platform today. And we're just going to walk through it. And for 15 minutes, we're going to walk through it. And that's it. Just that's it. And then next shift, we're going to do it again, but we're going to add a component where we, we throw it together, you know, and that's where we start really learning together in these small groups where you already have what's called psychological safety, but you already feel comfortable, right? With the folks around you. And so you start to build this, this knowledge together in a small group. And there's really, you know, there could be a lead trainer, if you, if you want to call it that, but really it's just peers working together to, to work through this, this piece of equipment and build knowledge together. Yeah, I think that's such a great point that you made about the equal access to learning mm -hmm. in this, you know, it has to be in a somewhat structured environment, or like you said, it's just on the whim, right, of the company officer and who's more dialed into training or more passionate about developing their members. 
So I, I really like that approach to make sure everybody has that equal equal access to the same information. Yeah, I have been so frustrated at times in my career where I have been, you know, paired with a company officer that I really wanted to learn from. And they just didn't have that that ability for whatever reason to impart all of the knowledge that I knew that was locked in there somehow, you know? Mm -hmm. And so giving them the ability through kind of a primer, you know, of here's, here's a topic. I'd like you to talk about it today. It's like, Oh, well, I can do that. You know, I can talk. I know a lot about this topic, so I can talk about that with my crew. And all of a sudden, you know, you're off and running. That little bit of structure yeah. gets it going. Well, even doing that with some younger members of your crew, is not mm -hmm. a bad thing. So it's like e equal opportunity teaching or instructing mm -hmm. where, you know, you have someone who just came out of the academy. You teach us how to use this SCBA. You're the one who just learned, learned it before everybody else. Right. Mm -hmm. There's po th that's also another avenue of this that people can look at. Yeah. I, Aaron, you, you said something before about asking questions and, and, you know, being curious some of the I, best. I said I'm the idiot in the room, but that's <laughs> all right. I, I didn't want to say yeah. that, but like, well, well, well. And, and actually, I and I adore that that particular. You know, people can call me an idiot for it, but mm -hmm. it's really interesting when I start asking questions. A lot of other people kind of go, yeah, "I didn't get it either." You know, like mm -hmm. I just want to understand the concept so I can teach it. You know, so well, there's yeah, there's two pieces there. One, everyone has the same question. There's only one or two people that are brave enough to ask it, and two. Some of the best questions I've ever been asked have come from brand new employees. As you know, someone that has been on the job for 20 years, at that point, like I was walking around an apparatus and kind of giving an orientation on it. And this, this brand new employee, I bet six months, asked a couple of questions that I had never really thought of. And they were just like, the simplicity in the question was what made it great. It's like, that that was a great question. I need to do a little bit of research on that because I'm I've been operating in a different space, but I really need to know the answer to that, you know. And so, oh, I, I think it's, yeah, it's it's great. It's it's great. So we've talked about a shared vision for learning, and then institute some type of structure for peer learning. Those are two of your four. Mm -hmm. What's what's another one that that departments should really look at and. and you know, assess how their department rates on, on that sure. particular, you know, component. Change management. So change management just kills us in, in the fire service. And I, I mean, I could spend hours just talking about my own failed initiatives and just, you know, walk that back to, it was a change management process that I didn't employ or I didn't, I didn't sell it in the way that people understood what what needed to happen or i didn't get small wins you know sir janky talks about small wins like that's so crucial to to say hey we asked you to do this and you did it right here in this little pocket and that's good we you know, you know we're gonna we're gonna point to that and show everyone else this is what we're looking for you know so there's just these it really doesn't matter in my opinion what change management process you use. There are a bunch of them out there. As long as you, you know, you look at the initiative that you want to you to employ and say, what, what change management process are we going to use to map this out from start to finish? And, and when I say start to finish, I mean, from the uh, initial onset of the idea to five years down the road to uh, measure and ensure competence that it's stuck. And so I think where we are really good in the fire service is we create content very well. Like we have an idea, it's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a class or something. And it's like, that's great, but what about the back end of this change to where people are bought into it, people understand why we're doing it, we, we see the vision of, of what it's supposed to accomplish. And then the one thing that I hardly ever see is people are complicated and people, there's a lot of fear and loss of control when you change something. 
So I'll take, I'll go back to SCBA. You know, when I came into the academy, I was using X platform SCBA. 10 years later, after I knew it forward and backward, drilled with it every day, you know, whatever, then we changed the platform to a, a brand new platform. And I lose the confidence that I had in that platform. And so how is the department going to support me as an end user in gaining, not only gaining trust and confidence in the platform, but knowing it, relearning it better or as good as I learned my, my old platform. That takes a lot of repetition and a lot of support. And so that is something that we can do on the front end. We can map that out. Columbia Southern University offers one of the most reputable fire professional development degrees and training programs in the nation. Touted by some of the most distinguished names in the U.S. fire industry, CSU's fire science program was created to reflect the industry's latest practices, including administration, fire safety, investigation, leadership, and more. Visit columbiasouthern.edu or call 877-347-6050 to learn more. Now, let's get back to the show. Can What's you an give ex- us a, an example of a change management? <laughs> ah, are we asking the same thing? Same question. I was just like, okay, you got me, but here's the idiot in me going, okay, give me an example. I, I yeah, I is know, it, but are they? Do they have names? Is it formal names, or is it more like a mindset or a philosophy around the process? Well, I mean, there are there are different processes, I guess. If you if you just Google change management, there's a lot of different. I think what's more important is the principles. So, because I, I don't want people to get hung up in the in the process, I want them to understand, you know, if we're sitting in a room and we have identified a problem that needs a solution, then that's when we start planning, okay, is this problem big enough to where we're going to rip away whatever is out there right now and replace it with something else? If so, if if the answer is yes, then we need to identify a solution that 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 identifies the problem so people understand. So, for example, I'll, I'll just walk through a, a, a change management process that I use for high rise. So we had a high rise procedure that was good, but it was outdated. The terminology didn't match what we were using. The resource uh, allocation didn't match what we had. And so we needed to change. And so first I tried to sell the change. So after I developed the, the, the process change, I went out and sat with every single battalion chief to sell the change, to say, here's the problem. Here's the solution. Here's what we, we want it to look like moving forward. What are your concerns? And so got it to a point where every uh, battalion chief that was going to use this system said sounds good so at that point it's like okay i've got buy-in from from this group now we need to come up with a a plan to roll this out in a way that that it's going to make sense to people so that's where you institute that your your training right but how many how many training offerings you have is it really depends on what kind of competency you want so if you want awareness level training, we're going to roll it out one time, have a nice day. If you want expert level training, it needs to be at the, you know, at the initial training, a refresher at three months, a refresher at six months, one in a year, something like that to make sure that, that we've got good understanding and compliance across the board. And then ideally, and this is this is hard, but ideally measuring measuring before and after, right? So if you gave a survey before, what's your understanding of high rise policy? Who does this when? And then at a year, give that same survey. That would be the kind of the gold standard for for that process. And then you follow it up, possibly within. You know, that, that's where that two-year plan then comes in. Okay, mm-hmm. how well do we think we grasp this? Well, okay for now, but let's let's reintroduce that week, you know, or month seven or eight real quick with a quick high-rise drill or summary at that point to make sure people know what's going on, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and that's where you come into that, that two-year plan again. Absolutely. And that's where, you know, when you're talking about the learning organization, that's, you then embed that into your future 
your your future training cycle so now we do high rise you know x x times a year or whatever and so we maintain that skill set and we don't allow that to slip off the plate to where now it's been five years we haven't trained on it and now we're going back to square one because we all forgot what we were supposed to do and part and of that, that process was to ask people if they understand and grasp what you've taught them like you're asking for feedback a lot correct you are and you know in that particular process i, I had some missteps along the way where i did pretty well at the at the beginning but some of the back end stuff i actually changed assignments in the middle of that process and some of the back end stuff didn't get completed the way that i wanted it to and we saw some gaps because of that we also didn't acknowledge some of those small wins the way that we should have and so you know getting out and drilling or you know maybe we had a, a high rise fire that wasn't a full full blown fire but it was a room and condensed fire on the sixth floor and someone used the high rise the new high rise protocol that's one where we should have said hey department this is an example of someone that that employed the new high rise system and it worked great good job team you know and so capturing some of those small wins along the way is really important and and so part of the survey is also one of your four isn't it well i mean this the survey, I, I think measuring in general is just, it, it's something that's very important that I just haven't seen us do as well as, as we, we could be across the board in the fire service, because you want to measure attitudes and competence, right? You want to measure people, how, how comfortable are you doing these things? What is your perception of these, of your, you know, do you feel like you're good at this or do you feel like you need more training and then on the other side you want something tangible uh some metric that you can measure you know how how well are we actually doing and so when we get those and we put them together then we can they're a check and balance we feel good about it and we're performing you know the metrics say that we're performing the way that we should be therefore that's a good that's a good place to be or we feel really good we think that we're doing really well but our metrics aren't you know don't look the way that we want them to the thing that really fascinates me about this is when we think about administering a survey for example to understand how people learn we're getting at a very individual learning style so how do you balance individual learning styles with a more structured process because we can't teach every single person differently mm -hmm. And that's what's so fascinating to me because we all know we all learn differently, right? So yeah. how do you find that balance between individual training and structured training? This is going back to that fourth piece that I wanted to talk about, which is helping people understand their learning style. And so we, we understand that, and just like Janelle is saying, that people learn differently and it is hard to tailor a learning style to every specific person and so there's there's kind of a some give and take there so if you look at a fire academy you've got your fire training staff they're going to come in and present information in the way that they do and then you're going to go out and do some some you know hands-on tactile stuff on the drill field and kind of cement that and that's that's kind of the way that that typically we would do that I think it's important uh, at the onset for people to understand where they gravitate. It doesn't mean that they can't learn in other ways. Uh, but what it does mean is, and I'll just take myself, I, I know that I am kind of a linguistic verbal learner. And, and so in that, in that way, I like to write flashcards. I will recite things. What I have to do is I have to see it take it back into a corner and make it my own. And once I make it my own, then I've got it. I'm good to go. And so, you know, during the fire academy, I, I would go through the process. I would see what's on the whiteboard. I would go out and do those, those tactile skills on the drill field. But then I would go home, write flashcards, memorize, do the things that I needed to do to make sure that I, that stuck. 
And so I think it's a skill for our, our training staff to be able to identify people that are, are maybe not learning the material in the way that they could be or are struggling and, and then circling back and saying, Hey, where are you at here? You know, are you not getting enough reps? Are you a, a visual, like a hands-on learner to where we need to go straight to the equipment and just get it right in your hands? Or do you need me to explain this more? Or do you need a couple of minutes to just process this, you know? And that's, that's kind of where my vision is, where we can start with something. We can start with just a, a process and then we can kind of adapt and modify to the need of the user. The one aspect we haven't even touched on is just how leadership plays into this, because mm -hmm. I know some people are thinking right now, like I would never ask my lieutenant that question because he would just, you know, you should know this, blah, blah, blah. The old burly, you know, kind of old school, you know, kind of attitude with it. But I think what this then also embraces is a leader that is open to listening, is is open to reading their their crews. You know, I think there's times where I've tried to give some type of training and I look and I got blank stares and I don't know mm -hmm. if it's just because I wasn't saying it properly, but you also have to be able to read people and be open to listening. Is mm -hmm. that the best term? I mean, what other characteristics are we talking about then to make sure that this change happens? Yeah. Two things come to mind. One is learning environment. And two is learning style. So sometimes, and you know, you, you tell me if this has ever happened in your department, but sometimes we will have uh, an employee that that is struggling for whatever reason as a new employee, and we will uh, give them a different look at a different station, and then they will thrive. And so to me, having seen that multiple times, it comes down to those two things. We've changed their environment, and for whatever reason, this the environment that they are now in is more conducive to them learning the material. And we have changed uh, something about their learning style or the people that are teaching them may resonate with them the, uh, in a way that the other one didn't. And sometimes we take it hard as, as firefighters, like, oh, I couldn't get the job done. And, and I don't think it's that necessarily. I just think it's finding the right match. And, you know, there, there are times where we can, maybe our learning environment is a little harsh and that is creating what you're talking about, where it's like, well, I don't feel comfortable or safe to ask these questions. So I'm just going to kind of fail forward here and, and try to make it through. And that's exactly <laughs> what I was just thinking about going back to Aaron's point about you know, company officer who's not exactly exactly welcoming or open to these different types of training. And mm -hmm. what I mean, we know that there are people listening thinking this isn't going to work at my department because I just don't have the right culture. There's just not the right culture here. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the leadership is just not going to be open to it. So for those people, what can they do kind of individually to kind of to take ownership for their own learning improvements? Yeah, I think, and it's a really tough question because this culture is, you know, is prevalent across the, the fire service. And I, I have started to see it shift. And as we get more people that really understand how people learn and, you know, culture in and of itself is, is an interesting word and definition because one scholar has defined it as things that have worked well enough over the course of time that we continue to do them. It doesn't mean that these are the best practices. It just means that it's stuff that we've been doing that seems to, to work. And so we keep doing it. And so when we talk about some of the, the harsher learning environments, uh, it's like, well, I went through it and I turned out okay. So it must be the way that this needs to go. And that's not necessarily true. It is so tough really relying on senior leadership to set a tone for their fire department that we want to support a, an inclusive learning environment to where people feel safe to ask questions and 
you know, one of the things that we can start with early, and I have a pet peeve here, it's how we treat our probationary firefighters. And, you know, sometimes we get in the mindset where we, you know, we show them the picture of, you know, big eyes, big ears, no mouth, and say, this is what I expect you to be. And then at a year when they've hit probation and, and finished probation, you expect them to all magically speak up and, you know, add all of this, you know, value to the organization where we've just taught you that, that that's not the expectation. And so really an alignment of across, you know, from recruit to probation to, you know, full membership on the department, that needs to be aligned. And the expectations need to be aligned to where questions should be coming out the entire time. Now, to get to your to your question, I think really has to do with learning style and and saying to your to yourself, okay, well, I'm not getting necessarily what I need from this individual, but I can still focus on my own learning style and know that if I'm a you know tactile hands-on learner, that I'm just going to get in the bay and figure it out. And I'm going to walk through this. I'm going to use YouTube videos. I'm going to use, you know, peers in other departments or other st stations or podcasts are really good for that. too. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> to say, better every shift, everybody better every shift. That's this is probably a very dumb question, but are there online tools where you can go take some assessments to figure out what type of learner you are? There, there are one of my little side projects that I haven't pushed through yet is I would like to create one for the fire service that uh, is fire service centric right now the the tools out there there's there's many that are that are researched and vetted they're good tools but they're general you know and so yeah that's something that's that's on my plate well please come to us first when you when you're ready to launch okay <laughs> <laughs> Come to us first, Janelle. You're not going to let them hang up without trying to get a date down for that. I yeah, know right. you better than that, which is great, uh, Chief. This is this is exactly what you and I were talking about before off camera, and I, I'm so glad we were able to replicate that. You know about organizational change, organizational learning, you know learning styles. Uh, we talked about leadership and how all this plays together. Of course, you have 20 different things, and I I, I have a feeling that we will read more about the other ones coming soon, hopefully, right, Janelle? You're probably hitting them up for that a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but these these four are remarkable, and we'll put them in the show notes. But we do have questions for you individually. We like to call them hot seat questions. Mm, cool. Janelle's got them. They're good. Janelle, you ready? You go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first one is, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the fire service right now? Well, I am going to frame it in in reference to what we've been talking about is uh, it's a challenge to continually keep up with the changing landscape and environment around us. And so as as things change quickly and, you know, the fire service doesn't necessarily always embrace change across the board, it, it lends itself to how fast can we learn? And how fast can we keep up? And then, you know, you don't want to be the fire department that's that's being left behind. You want to be the fire department that is on the front uh, edge of this stuff. And so not can we keep up, can we stay ahead is really the, the challenge. And everything that's out there really is encompassed in that challenge. That's a good one. Speaking of challenges, Chief, what's the biggest challenge you've overcome recently? I mean, I've had challenges in my in my personal life that have dwarfed any any challenge that I would ever face in on on the job. And to be here sitting with you talking and, you know, enjoying my career and and sharing this perspective has been something that I didn't know that I, I would be able to to make it to. So just being here, I guess, and overcoming some of those those challenges in my personal life. You just never know. You got to cherish everything you got and every day, you know, yeah. and I think is that where you're, that's where a lot of your passion probably comes from, too. right? Yeah. And I, I wasn't intended on talking about it, but. 
I, I lost my son when I, when he was 16 and that was in 2018 and, you know, that broke me, but that also led me into what we're talking about today is, you know, getting into something that I was really passionate about and trying to find my passion again, you know, and this has helped me to do that, you know, and in a way that I did not anticipate. And so it has been a lifesaver for me and I have just really appreciated it. Oh, appreciate that. Thank you for sharing. You know, just, yeah. you, we don't know what our, our fellow, you know, members are going through too. And, and, you know, not to be cheesy, but you know, you can relate it back to change. You can relate it back to education. Mm -hmm. You can re relate it back to, you know, we have to read and reach and communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, the, the fire service I love, which you do too, but you, you got to keep and find that passion. And, and hopefully you, you had others that you could rely on during that, that process. And it's great that you did find that and overcame that, that challenge with, you know, kind of keeping that passion going. Right. You know? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's given me a perspective where, yes, we love the fire service. We come to work to do a good job and, and we, we want to be here, but we all have lives, you know, we all have, you know, partners and marriages and children and, and health issues and just things in our life. And so, you know, as leaders, we really need to, it really needs to be top of mind for us, you know, to be like, Hey, this, this person isn't performing, but you know, we need to figure out if there's something we can do to help them on a personal level. And so that has really been top of mind for me, you know, especially in the last handful of years. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, just now having some great conversations with you is it's, it's like teaching and, and getting people to learn through connection mm -hmm. and learning how, like you said, most people don't understand how they personally learn because we're never asked. We're yeah. always just told this is how we're going to do it. And I, I think, you know, again, your candid, your, your, your honesty really breaks open so many other points just about, we got to be human and we have to realize that we're human mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, do a lot of self analysis and, and then take that analysis and, and look at other people too, and, and try to help them through that. So yeah, yeah. thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Chief, who has been the biggest influence on your life thus far, getting you where you are today? Oh, man, that's a tough question. I mean, I, I don't know that I could just put it to one person, you know? I mean, there's so many, I've had so many positive influences and, you know, from I, I don't know, from mentors in the fire service to my four children, to partners, you know, I, I just have, I'm very blessed that I have had so many opportunities to, to connect with people, you know, coworkers and friends. And just, I feel like I have just had so many different perspectives that have given me insight and helped me move forward and, you know, were there when I needed them. And, and so I, I, I just, I, I would feel really rough about naming one person for sure. I understand. Well, that's, that's it right there that you're finding mentors everywhere you go. And I think it, one, you have to be willing to learn from mm -hmm. them. And you have to have a great positive attitude about it too. And, and, and so I think those are two things that really comes out and we can see. And, uh, you know, the question among questions, because this is the Better Every Shift podcast, is how are you working to get better? Yeah, it is. I'll, I'll tell you what my challenge is right now is trying to balance all the things that I would like to do and do the best job I can for, for the people that I serve, you know, and six stations, a department that I'm really involved with. And, but I've, <clears throat> I've got these things that, that I really feel passionate about, you know? And so that's really the balance. There's not enough hours in the day to do all the things that I want to do, but I think balance is probably the key for me 
you know, doing those things that I know are going to be impactful uh, for the people that work for me and then doing the things that are going to be impactful for the organization and for the fire service as a whole. I think keeping those balanced. And when I'm talking to people, I often talk about people and projects, you know, those, those two things, there's got to be a balance as a leader, because if you are spending all your time with people, what they're asking you to do is you're to do these things. Hey, chief, can you fix this? Hey, I've, I've got a problem with this. Hey, this isn't working for me. And so if I come back next shift and grab a cup of coffee and I haven't done any of those things, you know, it's like, well, I asked you to do those things to help me do my job better. And so there's gotta be this balance between, okay, I'm spending the time with the people, but I also have to spend time with the projects to help the people, you know? Yeah. So getting those, those two things done is important. That helps build trust and, and finding that balance. Yeah. And we can't thank you enough for your passion. You just, it, it just comes out with every statement, every sentence. Uh, thanks so much for your knowledge. We look forward to more of that coming out, hopefully through fire rescue one and maybe some more podcasts. But again, if you are just listening to this, I, I highly encourage everyone to just tune into our YouTube cha uh, channel and, and just watch the passion that comes out from Chief Paskett here. It, it, it is definitely something that is contagious and Chief, don't lose that. And again, thank you so much for joining us. For you that are listening, again, make sure you jump, jump over to our YouTube channel. You can also go to firerescue1.com. We would love it if you would rate, review the show, please. Email us like Chief Paskett did. If you have suggestions, if you have, you know, any comments about the show, if you want to reach Chief, can they can they contact you? Yeah, absolutely. It's C R Paskett P A S K E T T at gmail.com. And he will exhume that passion to you a little bit and his knowledge. Thank you for for offering that, Chief. And we'll have that in our show notes. Uh, I think so many lessons, so many different things to take from this. The biggest thing is make sure that you're connecting with your people, listening to your people, and then relaying information in accordance to how they learn and how they listen. And I think that's all comes back to just great communication, great leadership, and then having an organizational plan to help those thrive that are within your organization. And it comes back to learning something doing something, and then sharing something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thank you, everybody, for listening.